Get Rich Education is brought to you by Norada Real Estate and GREturnkey.com. Welcome to Get Rich Education with Keith Weinhold, giving you information and ideas on the investment that has turned more ordinary people into millionaires and billionaires than anything else and can provide you with more wealth and happiness than you ever thought possible. Now, here's your host, investor, entrepreneur, business owner, and educator, Keith Weinhold. Hey, welcome to Get Rich Education, episode 145. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold, and thank you for your devoted listenership in 182 world nations from Germany to Ghana to Guatemala. We are going to build your wealth today. We might even change your life today. I can't get over the number of people that have told me that this show has absolutely changed their life. We're going to talk with a financial advisor today. Can you believe that? But first, you know, lately I seem to have more people than ever remark to me that I live a great life. And my reply to them is simply, well, of course. I mean, why would I want to live any other way? If you don't like your life, then why is this the life that you've designed for yourself? It's sort of like... um, Pardon me if I can't remember who said it. It was either Bob Proctor or perhaps Earl Nightingale or one of those old school finance and motivational speakers. Anyway, they simply said that if you want to change your life, then you've got to change your life. I invest in income producing real assets so that I don't have to work. I don't have a job. I have some pretty substantial freedom because at some point I chose to change my life and not just do what everyone else does. What's everyone else do? They invest in something that does not produce any income. So they have no chance, no chance of producing the freedom that they want. And then worse, they won't achieve long-term gratification either because they're heavily invested in buy and hold stocks then if that's not enough, they actually think that investing this way creates wealth. Oh, geez, dude, you've got to be kidding me. Can't you see what happened to everyone else that did this? Why are you so heavily invested this way? Where the inflation and the emotion and the fees and the taxes and the volatility usually makes their real return negative. That's precisely why the net result is that there is a retirement crisis today. So what is the problem with stocks? I mean, are they really all that bad? Yeah, they are. Conventional wisdom has long held that the way to become wealthy over the long term is to buy compounded investment in the stock market. So how did things get this way? Okay, well, when you look at a chart of historical stock returns, by making modest investments at regular intervals over a period of time, basically dollar cost averaging, small investors could create large amounts of wealth. This line of thinking is what bolstered most employers to source their 401k retirement plans with mutual funds that invest in the stock market. Unfortunately, the migration of the stock market into the mainstream of America has caused it to become less of an investment vehicle and more of a gambling casino. You could really say it's not investing at all. It's speculation. The primary purpose of the stock market is to provide companies with the means to raise capital for business investment by selling a partial ownership stake, also known as a share of ownership. Typically, investors were rewarded for their investment by the payment of dividends from the company profits. Therefore, stock market investing was originally based on the notion of finding a company that was likely to make sufficient profits to pay out robust dividends to you. Now, this sentiment changed as the secondary market for trading stocks became more popular. A primary issue of stock occurs when a company issues more ownership shares. A secondary stock transaction happens when one investor exchanges an existing ownership share with another investor. This is where the stock market turns into a roulette table, a casino. When the focus of investment shifts away from the ability of the company to viably pay dividends on a consistent basis and toward the probability that the secondary market will pay more for the company's stock at a future date, that's when stock investment becomes more like gambling. 
when returns are primarily based on price appreciation, continued growth in market value requires a perpetual stream of new buyers. Now, that can be true of both stocks and real estate, which is why we don't buy real estate for capital growth here at Get Rich Education. We buy for income production. The only factor that can elevate the entire stock market is if there's an aggregate increase in investment capital. As corporate profits grow, it's pretty natural to assume that more capital will be attracted to the market. But when stock market values rise faster than corporate profits, well, then the only cause can be a net influx of investment capital. In the United States, there were three landmark events that sparked a mammoth 25-year bull market for stocks. The first was the Nixon shock. The Nixon shock was a series of economic measures that President Richard Nixon undertook in 1971, and really the biggest one of those was the cancellation of other nations' ability to directly convert the United States dollar into gold. Gold was effectively depegged from the dollar. The second one was the passage of ERISA into law, the Employee Retirement Income Security Act in 1974. And ERISA created these standards and sort of a support structure and some stability for company-sponsored stock market investment plans that dramatically increased the supply of equity capital. And then the third were the series of substantial tax cuts in the 1980s and a major reduction in the cost of debt capital that spurred a rapid growth of corporate profitability which was about the time that we transitioned from the reign of Federal Reserve Chairman Paul Volcker to Chairman Alan Greenspan. But it was those three events that combined to create a massive increase in stock market investment that pushed values sky high. But these massive gains came along with a bit of a shadow. The problem that was created is that investors stopped directly buying stocks of individual companies, and instead they started investing in funds where a manager now buys and sells the stocks. Now, these brokers and these managers have control over incredible amounts of other people's investment capital, hopefully not too much of your investment capital, because this control gives them the power to create and destroy tremendous amounts of value based on the decisions that they make. It also channels market activity more and more toward Gambling is managers seek to maximize value appreciation, and it's this set of circumstances that is in the opposite of your interest as an investor, as managers are now incentivized to take these wild risks because giant gains mean that they get tremendous bonuses, whereas losses really only mean that they get fired, but them getting fired doesn't help you, so then the brokerage can tell you, the investor, that the manager got fired due to poor performance. And then that manager can just go on to work somewhere else. On top of that, most managers charge substantial fees for their services. That cuts deeply into your returns. There are more hidden charges in these arrangements than you probably understand. We're going to get into that someday. Most of the working class is already invested in the stock market. So there's really no large pool of new capital to attract so that these valuations can keep inflating, even with the millennials being a larger generation. Additionally, besides all these risks, there is another dynamic to consider, and that's that price-to-earnings ratios are well above their historical average. So that means the market is discounting in a future increase in corporate earnings, and if that earnings increase either doesn't come or takes longer than expected, it will most likely result in market values decreasing Future market appreciation is going to look pretty average by historical standards. Now, nominal values might only be pushed up by inflation once we see the conclusion of what we're in now, which is the second longest stock bull market in history. But your real returns in these vehicles, stocks, bonds, ETFs, mutual funds, they're typically less than zero when you factor in that inflation, the emotion, the fees, the taxes, and the volatility. So, you know, I asked the person then that would remark that I'm living this great life, well, why are you investing this way? Why are you planning your life and your future this way? And when the best answer to that question back is, I don't actually know, we've just always done it this way, then that's a problem. That's a problem anytime that answer is given, okay, to anything in life. I live a better life than most because I invest in cash flowing income property with long-term fixed interest rate debt 
with management already in place and in those stable markets in the Midwest and South, not volatile coastal markets. And I've heard some people, like my friend Marco, they call these linear and cyclical markets, and that's fine. I just choose to use the words stable markets and volatile markets instead to describe inland markets and coastal markets, respectively. Investing the way I invest is why I say, don't follow money, make money follow you, rather than chasing money around the nation as you look for a job. How about living where you actually want to live, whether that's a place that fits your personal interests or whether that's a place that's close to your family, and then make those rent checks from around the nation, get mailed to you every month, let them pour into you from Dallas and Birmingham and Indianapolis and Memphis and Jacksonville and St. Louis, those markets where the numbers work, and you get cash flow from your small down payment. A budget? The building of a budget? Oh, jeez. I've got no interest. A budget encourages penny pinching. That's the wrong mindset. That's the wrong plan. That's the live below your means mindset. Tear up your paper budget into a million little pieces instead of limiting the financial destruction in your life, which is all that a budget is there for. Well, instead, encourage financial construction in your life by building a cash flow statement, not a budget, a cash flow statement that grows the income side faster with cash flowing properties. See, that's financially constructive. A budget that promises only to attempt to limit your financial destruction. That is lame. That is impotent. That is avoiding losing rather than trying to win. But most people still aren't doing that because, well, as I like to say, the scarcity mentality is abundant and the abundance mentality is scarce. Budget builders have quit their daydream. Financially free beats debt free. Compound interest is lame. Compound interest is synonymous with stocks. Leverage is powerful. That's real estate investing. Do the right thing before you do things right. You could be doing what you think is right, rebalancing your asset allocation among your mutual funds annually, that's what you think is right, but you weren't doing the right thing because you were invested in perverted derivatives of corporate equity shares. And that's kind of a GRE game reset right there, a review of some of our core principles here. Well, let's get to our great guest today. Like a lot of our show guests, today's guest is also a Get Rich Education listener. Today's guest has worked in the financial services industry for more than 11 years, both in the corporate accounting and the investment world. Today, he owns a boutique financial planning business called Intellivest. His objective is to help people turn off the noise and challenge the traditional approach to financial planning and thinking. Boy, he sounds like my kind of guy. Joining us from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania today, welcome to Get Rich Education, Brent Sutherland. Keith, thank you for having me on. I've been binging on this podcast over the past few weeks, and I really enjoy what you're doing, so I'm excited to be a part of this. Well, thanks. Now, it would seem paradoxical to my listener to say that you sound like my kind of guy, and yet, on the other hand, you're a financial advisor because it's so easy to make fun of financial advisors because of the advice they give and what they sell, but you are indeed a financial advisor, so tell us about what you do. Yeah, that's I, I can see the kind of orthodox there, too, where I am a financial advisor, but I'm also a real estate investor. And it's humorous because when I'm in my peer group of financial advisors, I feel like I'm always kind of defending the real estate investor. And then when I'm in the real estate investing peer groups, I'm always defending uh, some of the financial planning aspects of my life, too. But I think in order to give you a broad spectrum of who I am, it probably makes sense to give you just a little bit of a background. I did start, and you mentioned this in financial services about 12 years ago. I started in accounting, and then I started working hands-on with investments. The good thing there is you start meeting quite a few people who are quite successful financially in life, and you start developing those connections, and you can start digging into their personal lives, too, and seeing what they have going on for them that maybe you can apply in your own personal world. Now, you meet quite a few characters, as you do with any profession out there, but <laughs> there are a few people that have really felt like they had it together. Now, some people, they come into the meetings and they're very stressed about exactly what's happening in the markets because it has a direct impact on their daily living conditions. There were some people that came in and it didn't seem like they really cared at all what was happening with their investment accounts. And that always intrigued me. And as I dug a little further, there was a commonality with all these people. They had something else going on in their life. They either had a, a business that they owned and operated and were successful with that, or they had real estate investments on the side. The commonality there is that both of those were generating some other income streams for them so they weren't quite as concerned about what was happening in their investment accounts. 
So this intrigued me. I wanted to have a little bit more financial security in my world, too. And at that point, I wasn't really set to start my own business, but I did want to dig into real estate investing. So I started educating myself and I did eventually buy my first property. And since then, I've accumulated a, a portfolio of eight single family properties. But Great. you know what happens is when you're a real estate investor and you get that bug and you're excited about it, but you're also working in that traditional investment advisory or financial planning world where they don't recommend that you purchase or your clients purchase real estate investing, that you're conflicted in what advice you're giving to your clients. So eventually I had to overcome that. So that's when I started my own shop. And that's where I am today, quite frankly. Okay, so at one point you were with, uh, and just clarify if I misspeak here, but at one point you were with more of a traditional brokerage house where you kind of had a hand tied behind your back and you could not recommend real estate investing to your clients. So one reason you started Intellivest is so that you could? That's exactly right. You know, the way the industry is set up is uh, the compensation structures for most firms do not allow for their advisors to really advocate for real estate investing. And it's really because there's two different structures that are out there. One's commission-based and one's fee-based, the compensation structure for advisory shops. The commission-based world, you know, they're really out to just sell products, whether that be in form of mutual funds or annuities. They get a commission back on whatever they recommend their clients. Now, they're not real estate brokers, so they're not going to recommend you go out and buy real estate with the money that you do have. They want that in-house so they can get their commission. Sure. Now, you have others that uh, also charge on a fee-based structure. The majority of these charge based on assets they're managing. So they charge a percentage of the total portfolio that they manage. Now, these are more traditional portfolios. We're going to have your stocks, your bonds, a various array of mutual funds, and maybe some alternatives, but it's not going to include physical real estate. So if that's their compensation, that fee based on the assets they're managing, what do you think the odds are that they're going to recommend you go out and buy real estate on the side because that doesn't benefit their pocket? There's all these conflicts of interest in the industry that don't get talked about enough but I do think that people need to start thinking about real estate as a form of investment in their own personal financial economy just because of the benefits it can provide. And we'll talk about those, but primarily that passive income stream, which I think benefits pretty much anyone out there. I don't know of anyone that's going to push back on the fact that they could develop other forms of income streams today in addition to what they already have going on. Right. And a lot of people, I imagine a lot of your clients, and you told me, you said you have some clients that feel like they've got it together, and you probably have to turn them around on that. But some clients, when they go to a financial advisor, they're not even thinking about passive income. That just doesn't even cross their mind. They don't even know it's a possibility. They're thinking about investing for capital gains. So maybe just tell us about one of those typical clients that you have there, Brent, at Intellivest that comes into you and thinks that they've got it all together. Can you make that mindset shift into a passive income mode for that person that just came in thinking, where can I get the best capital gain? Sure. And, you know, it happens all the time just because I think people, when they think about investing, primarily they think about traditional assets. We just discussed the stocks, the bonds, mutual funds, and they think about long term investing. Yeah. So they're not really thinking about what can this money do for me today? Now, you do have to kind of shift their mindset. And it really it can happen fairly quickly. And I deal with a lot of younger people who I'm trying to influence in my world here locally and plus nationally. But I try to paint the picture to them that, look, you don't have pensions set up for you anymore. It's just not, it's a thing of the past. It's not going to happen with any jobs you're going to jump into nowadays. And the social security system, while I don't think it's going to get completely depleted, I think it will be diminished from what it is today. So all these securities that were set up previously for most people are not going to be there for you. So you have to think about developing your own personal pension plan. One of the best ways to do that is through real estate. And I think that conversation really starts to register with people. Okay, this is something I need to do to develop financial security for me, not only down the road, but it can provide financial security for you today. And once you start talking to people about, okay, wait, my savings can actually do something for me now, as opposed to later, that light goes on in their head. And you can see that they're much more motivated to save, to start generating some other sources of income so they can actually go out and maybe develop some financial freedom here earlier in life than waiting till age 60 or age 65, whenever their health might be diminished and they can't even really enjoy their funds. That must be a total epiphany. That must be a total late bulb moment. You said you get a number of younger clients. For them to come in and be 26 years old and learn, oh my goodness, I can begin increasing my income without any additional work at age 26. A lot of people kind of lament the fact that pensions have gone away, and 
very well they should. But, you know, a pension plan, basically, more or less, that's something that guarantees an income stream when you're 60 or 70. So you can basically bring a traditional pension plan, effectively bring that back and bring it into your life when you're 26 or whatever age. How great is that? <laughs> I couldn't have said it better. How great is that? Honestly, to develop that pension early in life, it allows just for so many different things. One, if you're into this kind of early retirement movement, that's a great way to do that. Two, if you just want to break away from what you're doing now, maybe you feel trapped in a corporate job, you want to start your own business. This is exactly what happened to me. You know, my real estate holdings developed enough passive income cash flow, and it's not even that substantial, but enough to pay the bills that allowed me the confidence and the freedom to go out and start my own venture. So that can apply to anyone in their own world. Yeah. Well, you mentioned that you bought eight properties, and I want to ask you about that in a moment. But before we leave traditional financial brokerage conversation and the conversation with you and what you do differently, you mentioned how financial planners are often compensated either on a commission-based structure or on a fee-based structure. But now that you're kind of out in the open and that you began your own thing, I just wonder, are there any financial advisors that can be compensated based on the actual performance of the returns that they give the investor? That doesn't happen that often in the industry. There was a point in time where hedge funds were really compensating themselves on a structure where no matter what, they still charge 2% of what they were managing. And then if there was a performance above and beyond maybe a 5% benchmark or something like that, they would also take 20% of the performance ahead of that. But it doesn't exist in the industry where you don't pay a fee unless you're earning money for clients. That just doesn't happen. So I think where the industry is heading in order to be more transparent, and this is how I'm really kind of structured, is it's basically the fee per service model. It's probably about as transparent as you can get. And so what that means is that as opposed to going in and you hand your money over to someone and they charge a percentage of what they're managing for you, you basically have a menu of items you can choose. Say, I want a financial plan. Here's the price for that one plan, and then I can be on my way. Or you're going to do some work for me financial planning wise. Let's just set that up on an hourly charge. So whenever you're not working for me, I'm not paying you. You know, it just kind of makes sense. And I think that's where the industry is heading. There's a growing movement. It's more in the younger space. I can tell you that than the old space. I think like any industry, the old guard has a hard time letting up, you know, kind of what they know. But you're seeing a lot more of this in the younger space, which gives me hope for the industry as a whole. That's right. Now, the last time I visited a financial advisor, and it's been several years, Brent, is I went into their office, nice enough kind of elderly gentleman downtown, and we probably talked for 30 to 45 minutes, and he was trying to get me as a client so that I go ahead and purchase his products and invest with him and have him as my manager. The one thing I remember the most is he had a large dominant chart on the wall, I think kind of as a backdrop for really every discussion that he had in there with a prospective client. And that chart on the wall was just the long-term history of the Dow. It was a X and Y graph charting its performance over time. And there are a lot of dips, but in general, it's just up, up, up. And basically, that's the premise that he was trying to sell me, which is, I think, a lot of the same thing that he tries to sell others. Well, if you invest with me, you can perhaps track the performance of the Dow Jones Industrial Average over time, like that's some aspirational thing. And of course, that chart was not adjusted for the fees that they charge. Of course, that chart was not adjusted for inflation. And most people just don't even know to ask those very questions. No, not at all. And, you know, I'm very familiar with that chart. It is a good selling point for most people. And there's a reason why they show you the long term historical trend. Yeah, because it, it does look more favorable. It looks like a, a slow and steady trajectory upward. Now, obviously, these charts are dating back to maybe 1900, 1929, something like that. But if you break that down into 10 year segments, it's going to look a lot more volatile. And if you think about the average bear market, stock bear market last two years, you know, over the grand scheme of things, since 1929 or 1900, it's not going to look that bad on a chart. But if you're living through that, two years is a long time. I'm going to tell you that. And as an advisor, it can be very long of a time because you have people calling you that are extremely upset. I think that's why it's important people start thinking outside of just solely owning stocks and bonds and start thinking about some other alternatives that can counterbalance what you have going on in your world. Yeah, now this is hardly news to anybody, but financial advisors are humans, okay? And as humans, we have these emotional predispositions to buy and sell at absolutely the wrong time. So if I hired a financial advisor in the traditional sense like that, 
I talked about the Dow Jones long-term average being adjusted for inflation or fees, but we didn't even talk about emotion. And see, financial advisors, sometimes like they feel like they need to justify their role. They need to justify the fact that they've been hired. So they might trade a little bit more often because they don't want to appear complacent. They want to make it look like they're working for the client. So when they trade, they just can often fall into the same emotional predisposition to go ahead and buy high because things have run up for so long and there's so much momentum behind that and to sell low because they're humans. They get discouraged. It comes back to an emotion and they might want to cut the losses for their client. So you can really even look at a long-term chart and think it's, in a sense, something that needs to be emotionally adjusted as well as it needs to be adjusted for inflation and fees. Exactly. And you know what happens there, too, is you hit it right on the head. Clients will get upset whenever markets are doing poorly, and they'll be enthusiastic about the markets when they're doing positively. Now, what happens, too, is it's not all sectors of the market that are probably performing positively or negatively at the same time. So whenever you get that call from your clients, theoretically, as an advisor, and one specific sector of the market is going down, the client is complaining. And as an advisor, what you want to do is you kind of want to stop that bleeding. You want to put the client in a happier space. So like you said, what you do is you say, okay, we'll do is we'll diminish the exposure to that particular sector of the market at a moment in time when you should not be diminishing that exposure to that sector of the market. In right. fact, you probably should be buying. But what the advisor is doing is they're just wanting to make the client happy and they're giving in to that emotional aspect that you just touched on, which can be detrimental. And so over time, maybe that stock chart that you're Perspective advisor you spoke with on the wall looks really lucrative over time. Like you said, those emotional attachments that go into play there, that's going to diminish that long term trajectory downward over the course of time. So emotions definitely play a part and you can't discount that fact. But it's easy to discount, Brent, because I think an individual just thinks, oh, no, I'll be emotionally stronger than that. But no, when you're in the moment, you often cave in emotionally. It's just kind of like polls out there that show that. 80% of people think that they're better drivers than they really are. You know, it's just kind of one of those things that, oh, no, I'll, I'll figure it out. I won't be weak in that moment. I'm just better than that. But you're really not. One really does give in to that emotion. So, well, I think we can agree that most financial advisors don't discuss real estate investing because their compensation structure just won't allow for that. Another thing I find really interesting, Brent, is that financial advisors in this entire financial world, real estate investing is perceived as an alternative investment. And my question is, how in the heck can real estate be perceived as an alternative investment, yet these derivatives that you don't even understand that are invested in the stock market, that's something that's seen as mainstream, and real estate investing predates investing in equities. Yeah, it's one of the more natural forms of investing that have existed over the course of time. Right. And I think what happens here, too, is often in financial services, you'll see the term alternative be associated with something that we don't quite understand. You know, you're just going to mix it into this category of different types of investments that can perform a little bit differently, maybe than in stocks and bonds. Now, oftentimes what happens is advisors just really aren't educated on the proper way to invest in physical real estate. So for lack of sounding too uneducated, they're going to avoid the topic completely. So that happens, uh, quite frankly, oftentimes. Then, again, like you mentioned, too, we'll just lump it into that alternatives category and pretend like it's something a little bit more taboo that, that clients really don't need to explore. Right. So, I mean, a couple of different reasons for that. But I do think we need to have a broader and more depth education in this subject matter, especially for advisors. Um, I will say that there are a couple of programs across the country that are going into place at some universities that are really digging into financial planning and incorporating some of the real estate investing with that. It's still fairly new. But again, this, like uh, some of the changes to the fee structures, give me hope that maybe the industry is headed to a better direction down the road. Yeah, well, that's good to hear that there might be some educational inroads because once one gets out into the consumer credit world, a lot of times they just really don't learn this stuff. Real estate is the best product, but they have the worst sales force out there. <laughs> that's very true. That's very true. <laughs> You're listening to Get Rich Education. Our guest is in Televest's Brent Sutherland. We're going to talk more about some numbers when we come back. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. Cash flow real estate investors nationwide and worldwide, this is Get Rich Education's Keith Weinhold. Forbes has rated Memphis, Tennessee as the number one cash flowing market in the world. 
Our good friends at Mid-South Homebuyers have been Memphis's premier turnkey real estate provider for 14 years with a stellar reputation and an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau. Owner Terry Kerr was born and raised in Memphis. Yeah, he knows the market and has renovated and sold over 1,000 houses in the Memphis area. Find out what their many repeat buyers already know. Their houses are completely renovated, even come with a one-year builder's warranty and a lifelong rental guarantee. They're a perfect fit for the first-time out-of-state investor or the seasoned investor diversifying their portfolio. Mid-South Homebuyers Friendly Staff makes investing easy. Learn more at MidSouthHomeBuyers.com or give them a call at 901-217-HOME. Are you having a hard time finding great investment properties? Unfortunately, the best deals are rarely found locally. Successful investing begins with the right properties in the right markets. Norada Real Estate provides everything you need to invest in the best deals across the U.S. Our simple, proven system will help you create real wealth and passive monthly cash flow. Get your free copy of the ultimate guide to passive real estate investing at noradarealestate.com slash guide. That's N-O-R-A-D-A realestate.com slash guide. Hi, this is Rich Dad Advisor Garrett Sutton. You're listening to the always valuable Get Rich Education with Keith Weinhold. Don't quit your daydream. Welcome back to Get Rich Education with our guest in Televest, Brent Sutherland. Brent, you bought eight income properties. Tell us about those. Yeah, Keith, uh, this was all within at the beginning of last year and all throughout 2016. What I did was I had been putting money and plugging away into the condo I owned prior to. And this was before I really jumped on board with the concept of cashing out the equity there to start investing in some other sources that might generate some passive income flow for me. So it was kind of a quick ride. But once I bought that first property and I started seeing those returns, I was quickly hooked, like most people can probably attest to. So that one turned into eight probably a little more quickly than I would have expected originally. But I tell you what, it's been a fantastic run so far. We can dig into some of the numbers here if that would be helpful for you. Yeah, that would be helpful. I just wondered what happened, though, after you bought your first income property and you got that first income cash flow check in the mail, usually coming from your property manager. It's usually only maybe $200 cash flow from that first income producing single family home. And that $200, it doesn't change your life, $200 a month, but yet it does change your life because it changes your mindset. And you're like, wow, this thing really works. This actually puts cash in my pocket in young age, in middle age, and old age. This changes everything. And that probably had something to do with why you went on to buy eight in a short period of time. Exactly. I mean, I saw the cash sitting in my bank account. And once I bought that first property and it was yielding what it was to me, and I was getting probably anywhere in the range of 250 to 300 after net of all expenses and even escrowing money aside for future vacancy and future capital expenditures, I was still seeing about $250 to $300 a property. That becomes very addictive. You get excited after that first check. And so when I saw that cash sitting in my bank account and then started visualizing what that could be doing for me in the form of cash flow in addition to other benefits, uh, that's why I quickly jumped on investing in a few others in that short time frame. Okay. So you come from the financial advisory world. So how do you break down your rate of return from your income properties? Because at least with the numbers, that's kind of what we're after is that total rate of return and what that's really doing for us. So how do you break that down on your properties? Well, the way I like to look at this for my properties is one, and this is my primary objective, is I'm looking for cash flow on all my investments. I, I don't play the appreciation game. I don't think you really are an advocate for that on your show from what I can tell. Right. But I really shoot for cash flow. So that's my first and foremost objective. But in addition to that, when you're looking at the calculation, I try to factor in here too, okay, what is the principal pay down? How is that going to impact my total cash on cash return that I put into the property? And then in addition to that, I'm going to look at some possible appreciation on that property. So that's going to also enhance my return from that initial investment I've made on the property. Then on top of that, you have to look at the different tax benefits that you're going to get from that property as well. So there's all kinds of tax advantages to investing in real estate with the depreciation and everything else that you can write off. That income that you're receiving from the properties is going to get treated at a diminished rate than what you would get if you were just working a W-2 and that paycheck was coming directly to you. So those tax advantages there have to be taken in consideration when you're looking at the total return. 
Now, just some quick kind of back of the envelope numbers. There was one property I bought that was 85000 was the sales price. That property, I got a pretty good uh, lease on that property, and the rent is going and still is going for 1150 a month. Now, after principal and interest and after taxes, after insurance, after setting aside money for management, too, I'm completely hands off on these properties, and then setting aside another 10% for future expenses and possible vacancies, my total net cash flow on that property is about 271 a month. So if you look at that on the total amount I had to put down, so that's about 32.52 in cash flow a year on that about $25,000 I put down. That's slightly under 13% cash on cash rate of return. Now if you add to that appreciation and if you add to that the principal pay down and if you add to that in addition to some of the tax benefits, I'm looking at a cash on cash return, a real rate of return, maybe not on paper all the time, but a real rate of return that's going to be upwards of about 25% on that total amount I put down, and which is fairly amazing. I've looked at returns through the course of my career in the stock market arena, and a good return there is going to be maybe 10%. You'll have years that it's higher. You're going to have a lot of years that it's lower than that too, but compare that versus 25%, and it's just a no-brainer that that's a good place that I need to start putting money into in addition to what, I, what else I have going on. Sure. And that 25%, importantly, you've already calculated management into that, right? That's what makes it passive. Correct. Yeah. So you've mentioned appreciation. And of course, it's leverage appreciation. It's not just appreciation at the prevailing rate as prices go up. You, secondly, you mentioned cash flow. Thirdly, you mentioned principal pay down. Fourthly, you mentioned the tax benefits. And sometimes there are questions about that, those tax benefits. It's like, well, should that really be part of your rate of return? But when depreciation is factored in, and that's a non-cash expense that you get that the government just gifts you, meaning that you did not have to spend any money in a write-off. You are just gifted that portion of a write-off from the IRS. That's why I validated that it should be part of the rate of return. And then just the one thing we haven't mentioned, Brent, I kind of call it five facets that one has as long-term leveraged fixed interest rate debtors because we have that inflation hedging benefit. If we buy a $100,000 property and get an $80,000 loan on it, down the road, we don't just have to pay back $80,000 in today's dollars. We get to pay that down with $80,000 in future years' dollars. So that diminished purchasing power of the dollar over time as more and more dollars circulate in the economy and wages go up and prices go up, it gets easier to pay back. So I add in a rate of inflation conservatively of, say, 3% to my rate of return as well. You know what? That's very smart. And I'll probably do the same myself now that I think about it. If you were to buy a CD at the local bank and it might be a two year CD that's going to pay you 2%, there's going to be no inflation hedge on that. Right. It's just going to be the 2% flat. But if you have a property that's giving you a cash on cash return, hopefully of upwards of maybe 10%, if not more, in addition to that 10%, you're also getting the inflation boost if uh, real commodity prices do expand. So that's a smart move. That's a, definitely a fifth ad there. Yeah, and that's a point I bring up with some people that are leery about debt. Okay, well, if you don't get a loan, you don't get the leverage appreciation. You only get the straight appreciation value. You don't get the principal pay down from the tenant that you mentioned. But then thirdly, you also do not get that inflation hedging benefit, which is kind of the fifth of five facets. So really, when you originate a loan, you just brought three of those five facets into play, and it's so important to get that loan right. And one thing I wanted to kind of point out, because I was looking at these numbers prior to us jumping on the show today, too, and I don't want to get too deep into the weeds, but I think it's important for people to understand, since we're talking about the numbers here, you have that potential in real estate. If you buy the right property, I think that's important, first and foremost. You need to make sure that property is going to do for you what you need it to do and perform properly. So you do your education up front, you buy the right piece of property, and you do find something that's yielding you a real rate of return of 20 plus percent. Just compare that to what happens in the stock market. Now, looking over the past 15 years, the S&P 500 has generated a return of 7.7% annualized. So you can expect that on an annual basis. But think of the risk that's embedded within that. So we measure this by looking at the standard deviation. So that means how much above and below that expected rate of return, that 7%, is that supposed to fluctuate? It's going to be about 15% above or 15% below in any given year. That's a lot of volatility to take on just for that 7%. Now, if you can invest in real estate on the opposite side and get that potential 20 plus percent real rate of return, your fluctuation in pricing is going to be a lot more diminished in real estate than it's going to be in the stock market. So it's just going to make for a much more smooth, emotionally safe ride than what you're going to get on the other side of the equation there. So I think it's important to point that out. 
Right. That's a great point. And some people are like, well, so what if something's volatile? It just all matters with how much I end up with at the end or whatever. No, I mean, volatility does matter. With this greater standard deviation that Brent's brought up for the S&P 500 index over time, it's the whole effect where if you have an item that's worth $100 and it drops 50% in value, now it's worth $50. And then if it goes back up 50% in value in year two, now it's only up to 75 bucks. So you started with 100 you've only got 75 and yet your rate of return can be stated as zero. So it's that deleterious volatility effect that Brent's bringing up, and you have a more stable asset with real estate, so you're less likely to fall victim to that effect. Exactly. And you know, something I hear quite often, too, is that people will read in the paper or they'll hear a headline in the news and, and they'll, they'll look at and they'll hear someone mention that real estate pricing historically has increased at a rate of about maybe three and a half to four percent annualized. And then they'll compare that number that they're getting from that price standpoint from whatever resource that they heard that on. They'll compare that to what they hear about the stock market. Right. They can generate. And they'll say, well, stocks generate, you know, roughly 8 to 10 percent annualized and real estate only generates maybe four. Why would I ever invest in the real estate or the stock market? But you're not taking into consideration some of these other factors that we just discussed. Now, maybe if you put all your cash into a property that wasn't cash flowing positively and it was just going to remain stagnant for a long period of time, you might hit that 4 percent rate return that we're talking about. But <laughs> You have to take into account that you can leverage these properties. You can get that cash flow on top of that if you buy the right property. And there's so many other lucrative benefits that don't get included into that basic headline number that some people might read or hear. So if you're one of those people that have heard that, you know, just get rid of that misnomer that it's only going to be a three and a half to four percent return. You have all these other benefits that you need to factor in into addition. Exceedingly few people understand the five facets, which are the five profit centers in real estate investing. In fact, most real estate investors don't even understand where all the returns are coming from. So, Brent, I mean, coming from the financial advising world, there's one really popular word in investing, probably especially among amateurs, and that's the word of diversification. So, what do you tell a client today that comes into IntelliVest when they express concern and, and that they want to be adequately diversified? Or do you bring up concern and that they're not adequately diversified? So talk to us about diversification. Diversification is a funny term because you can apply it to a few different sectors of someone's financial world. But most often when you hear the term diversification mentioned in, with any conversation involved with financial planning, Oftentimes what's happening is that advisor is going to be referring to the portfolio of someone. So that's going to be their mix of their account that has all the stocks and the bonds in it, how well diversified that portfolio in particular might be. Now, while portfolio diversification is important, I believe income diversification is more important because what happens is if you face a situation where maybe you lose your job, then it's not going to really matter if your portfolio that that advisor is managing for you is well diversified or not. You have an emergency on your hands present day. You need to pay the bills. You need to take care of your family. On the other side of the equation, like I mentioned, if you have some income diversification in place and you do face a situation where maybe you lose your W-2 job, then you have other sources of income coming in that can provide the foundation for you to kind of remain stable, remain on your feet, put food on the table. It's not going to be as big a strain on your world as it would be if you didn't have that in place. So, I think sometimes you just need to think of diversification in a little bit different light, think more creatively about it, and think of it in terms of income diversification. And that's where these passive income sources can really help you out. So real estate being one of the primary drivers behind that can really provide you a benefit if you do face an emergency situation where you, your spouse, or someone else, and it could be a health event where you're forced to step away, something like that happens that's fairly catastrophic, it's not going to completely wipe out your financial picture. That's right. What about 401ks? How do you advise people with respect to 401ks? This is an interesting one. And because it, I'm sure uh, this has happened maybe to you in, in your life. It happened to me in my life, too. But you're trained throughout the entirety of your early career and your early investing career, too, that you need to sock away all you can into your re retirement accounts. Now, they are attacked. There are a lot of tax advantages to doing so. And so it does look lucrative from the initial set. But what happens if you do get involved in real estate investing and you see these types of returns that we've been discussing here, you want to start allocating more and more of your savings towards real estate instead of investing into your 401k. And sometimes you can feel like your money's being trapped there. There's so many rules attached to it, really pull it out until age 59 and a half traditionally. So what I tell people 
is if you have caught this real estate bug, and hopefully a lot of people do, and I'm sure a lot of people have that have been on your show here that listen to your show, is that if you want to transition more towards real estate investing, a lot of times if you do have that 401k set up, the companies will incentivize you to save by offering you a company match. And usually they're going to match up to probably not more than 5% of what you're contributing, but that's free money. And I have a hard time telling someone not to at least contribute up to that match because that's 100% return on what you're putting in. And that money will be there. It'll grow tax deferred. There's some advantages to it. But once you hit that mark, start thinking about saving to maybe an account that's going to be used towards purchasing some other assets that can generate some passive cash flow for you. For the reasons that we just discussed, I think income diversification is very important. If you are on board with the idea of retiring a little bit earlier in life as opposed to waiting until age 60 or 65, it's going to be paramount that you have to start saving to other sources as opposed to putting everything into your 401k. But if you do have a match, like I said, save up to that match because that's free money. It just makes sense to do so. And there are ways of pulling that money out at a later date, especially if you step away a little earlier. You just have to think a little bit more creatively about how to do that. But save up to that match. Anything on top of that, put towards an account where you can start investing some other sources. Yeah, I've kind of said the same thing on my show before as well. If you get a dollar-per-dollar match, invest up to that level, but not beyond that. And if you don't get a dollar-per-dollar match, you really got to start asking yourself why you're not investing in a cash-flowing instrument. So most 401k investors have significant exposure to the stock market. And what kind of advice do you have for someone that has a large exposure in the stock market today, whether that's in a retirement fund or outside of a retirement fund? Well, today especially, you see the news and you're seeing it pretty much every day. There's an article about stock market is at new all-time highs. You know, how do you invest your money now? So that's a big concern on most people's minds. And if you look relative to historical valuations, especially in the U.S. markets, the U.S. stock market is overvalued relative to where it has been historically. So you have to start thinking, okay, how do I protect my money in case and when we do have a pullback in the markets? I'm not here to predict when that's going to happen. I feel like that's a fool's game, but I think at some point there will be a correction. And these things just happen. That's the way it is. One thing you can do, and I don't think there's anything wrong with this, is move a little bit more money that you have in your accounts there into something more stable. If you have a money market fund that's not going to really feel the impact of a pullback in the markets, I would advise maybe talk about shifting maybe a quarter of what you have in your accounts towards that money market fund. Now, a lot of people, what they do as investors is they have a home country bias. And a lot of investors in the U.S. do this exact same thing where their entire stock market position is all in U.S. markets. Right now, that's something that's going to be dangerous for you just because the U.S. markets are priced. They're a bit overvalued relative to where they have been historically. But international markets are actually priced pretty favorably compared to where they have been historically. So you can shift some of that exposure you have in your stock portfolio towards the international markets. And I think you're going to be shielded there from some of the probably whipsaw effects that might happen into the U.S. space if we do get a major pullback. And what happens is it just takes a small event to set off a little bit of panic, and then you'll see those markets collapse pretty quickly. So you want to go ahead and set yourself up today to prevent some of the major headaches if you can. But I think two things, you can raise a little bit of cash in your portfolio. There's nothing wrong with that. Just don't sell out completely because it's tough to time these markets. But also, Think about getting some other exposures in your stock portfolio, maybe towards the international side where you're going to have probably, I can't predict this, like I said, but probably more favorable performance over the short to midterm range than you're going to see in the U.S. markets. Well, Brent, as we're kind of winding down here, how would you advise people if there's someone out there that already has a traditional financial advisor and they want to jump ship? What you have to do, and this is difficult sometimes to achieve, you have to find someone who's going to be on board with your values and the fact that you want to go and start investing in other forms of investments besides stock and bonds and especially real estate investing. Now, there's a select group of advisors that are really out there that are doing this, but you can find them through a, what I like to refer to a resource online. It's called the National Association of Personal Financial Advisors, NAPFA. But if you go to their website, you can just Google search NAPFA, find an advisor, and it'll pull up their search portal. But this is a database of people, advisors and nationally that just perform services for that fee-only, fee-per-service model that we talked about previously that's more transparent. And when you search for an advisor there in your local market, you can also check a box below, and it has some detail about different options you can pick. But you can check the box that has real estate investments as a specialty of the search that you're putting into the system for the advisor. So hopefully there will be someone more local to your market that does specialize in real estate investing. So they might have a nice blend of traditional financial planning skills 
and also investment analysis skills for the real estate picture as well. So I would encourage everyone to search in their local market, see if they can find someone there. If you're talking to your advisor now and they're pushing back on investing in real estate, you know, you might have a longstanding relationship with this advisor and there might be some trust there. But if you're on different pages, you know, sometimes it makes sense just to jump ship. So I would encourage everyone to do a little bit of research, uh, search that tool, see if you can find someone locally, and then just have that conversation. Most people will give you a free consultation just to discuss what their service model looks like, and you can get a good feel whether or not that's going to be a good fit for you. Brent sure has a good command of things since he comes from the traditional finance world and now he knows about investing in real assets. So Brent's also a good person to look up if you want to consider pulling money out of a retirement account and investing that in something else. And that doesn't always have to be real estate. Maybe that's also gold or platinum or silver or to start a business or anything else. So, well, Brent, how can our listeners learn more about you and Intellivest? I think the best place to go is probably to just go to my website. It's uh, intellivest.com, and it's N-T-E-L-L-I-V-E-S-T.com. I have a lot of resources there. Now, currently, I'm registered to only practice with uh, clients who are located in Pennsylvania. I'm trying to expand that, and I think I might do a more consultative type of approach where I don't have to be so hands-on and registered in every state. That's something I'm going to explore here in July so I can talk to people more nationally as opposed to just locally. But there's a lot of good resources on the website, and I'm trying to develop more content. I can gain more exposure to more people and help out more people. So I would encourage people to check that out. You can contact me. I'm always happy just to have a casual conversation if you just want to talk about some of these subjects a bit further. Yeah, Brent's a great resource, and he makes himself very available too. Brent Sutherland, thanks so much for coming on to Get Rich Education. Thanks very much, Keith. This has been great. Yeah, great job, Brent. Brent Sutherland, I really like how he brought up volatility. It's been a while since we've discussed why that's so erosive to your long-term ROI. And you've really got to appreciate Brent's honesty, his candor to be a financial advisor and come speak out about this. Brent's website, Intellivest.com, is in the show notes for you. One sort of quirky thing that I like on his site is that he has some personal stats on a Topps baseball card, something that a remorseless statistics nerd and sports fan like me can relate to, batting average, home runs, RBI, stolen bases. I think that most anyone that's serious about investing has sort of a statistical bent to them. Well, hey, I've really got to thank you for something. My first ever book called Seven Money Myths That Are Killing Your Wealth Potential was just released last month freshly, and it is the only book that I know of, and certainly the only book in its category, that has all five-star reviews. Every review is five stars, so I thank you for that. The book is a quick read. You can read it in under two hours in either paperback form or the Kindle electronic version is how it's available. You know, some people work on books, they make it so long, 320 pages, 480 pages. As I worked on it, I tried to whittle it down and lean it down so that it was substantial yet approachable. The world has a financial education problem, so a book like this helps solve that. But, you know, maybe more importantly is the world has a reading problem. Most people don't read because they didn't finish their last book. Will that change for people with this book? Because it's short, it's simple, it's digestible. It's even nicely spaced so that you don't have any big paragraph blocks with like 20 lines of text all in a row that cause eye strain and make readers want to put the book down. In the book, I tell you how home equity is unsafe, illiquid, and its rate of return is always zero. I give you 10 examples of how to expand your means rather than live below your means how to stop your big pay cut that you're giving yourself and instead start giving yourself a pay raise and why you want to avoid being debt-free and quite a bit more. So you can grab my new book now at getricheducation.com slash book. And that simply takes you right to the Amazon page for the book. You could just go to Amazon and search my name the same way. Many of you were anticipating that I would write a book so that you could read about this rather than just hear from me every week. And now you can do that as well with a book that's quite simple and approachable. Again, getricheducation.com slash book. I'm going to bring it back here next week because I've got that drive to help you build your wealth. Don't quit your daydream. You've been listening to Get Rich Education, telling you what the wealthy won't tell you about real estate and investing.
Nothing on this show should be considered specific, personal or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of Get Rich Education, LLC exclusively. The preceding program was brought to you by your home for wealth building, GetRichEducation.com.